Hey guys, and welcome to another of these readings of Chapman's Homer. We're on to book three, and we're going to have the duel between Paris and Menelaus, in which a bit of the background is given to us about Helen. And then after the inconclusive result of it, it gives leeway to the rest of the battles, which are going to happen in the subsequent books. So let's get to it. The argument. Paris, betwixt the hosts to single fight, of all the Greeks dares the most hardy knight. King Menelaus doth accept his brave, conditioning that he again should have fair Helena with all she brought to Troy. If he subdued, else Paris should enjoy her and her wealth in peace. Conquest doth grant her dear wreath to the Grecian combatant. But Venus to her champion's life doth yield safe rescue and conveys him from the field into his chamber, and for Helen sends, whom must to lovers full disgrace offends. Yet Venus, for him still makes good her charms, and ends the second combat in his arms. Gamma the single fight doth sing twixt Paris and the Spartan king. When every least commander's well best soldiers had obeyed, then both the hosts were ranged for fight the Trojans would afraid, the Greeks with noises crying out and coming rudely on, at all parts like the cranes that fill with harsh confusion. A brutish clangs in all the air, in ridiculous war, eschewing an unsuffered storm shot from the winter's star. Visit the ocean and confer the pygmy soldier's death. The Greeks charge silent and like men bestowed their thrifty breath. In strength of far resounding blows, still entertaining care of either's rescue when their strength did their engagement stare. And as upon a hill's steep tops, the south wind pours a cloud, the shepherds thankless, but by thieves that love the night aloud, a darkness letting down that blinds the stones, cast off men's eyes. Such darkness from the Greek swift feet made all of dust did rise. But here, stern conflict mixed both strengths for Paris, step before the Trojan host. I thought his back a panther's wide. He wore a crooked bow and sword and shook two brazen-headed darts, with which well-armed his tongue provoked the best of Grecian hearts to stand with him in single fight, whom when the man wronged most of all the Greeks so gloriously saw stalk before the host, as when a lion is rejoiced with hunger half forlorn, Find some sweet of prey as a heart whose grace lies in his horn, or silver goat, which he devours, though never so pursued, with dogs and men, so Sparta's king exulted when he viewed his fair-faced Paris, so com exposed to this thirsted wreck. Whereof his good cause made him sure the Grecian front did break, and forth he rushed at all the parts, armed, leaped from his chariot, and royally prepared for charge, which seen cold terror shot. The heart of Paris, who retired as headlong from the king, as in him he had shunned his death. And as a hilly spring presents a serpent to a man, for underneath his feet a blue neck swollen with poison, raised and her sting out to greet his heedless entry. Suddenly his walk he altereth, starts back amazed, is shook with fear, and looks as pale as death. So men allows Paris, scared. So that divine-faced foe, shrunk in his beauties, which beheld by Hector he let go. This bitter check at him, accursed maid, but in beauty's scorn, impostor woman's man. O oh, heaven that thou hadst ne'er been born. Or being so manless, never lived to bear a man's noblest state, the nuptial honour, which I wish because it were a fate much better for thee than this shame, this spectacle doth make a man a monster. Hark! How loud the Grecians laugh, who did take their fair from a continent of parts as fair a rape, though matched of nature, like their queen, no soul and empty shape. Takes up thy being, yet how spite to every shade of good fills it with ill. For as thou art, thou couldst collect a brood of others like thee, and far hence fetch ill enough to us, even to thy father, all these friends. Make those foes mock them thus. 
In thee for whose ridiculous sake so seriously they lay, all Greeks in faith upon their neck, so wretch not dare to stay. Weak men allow us, but twas well, for in him thou hadst tried. What strength lost beauty can infuse, and with the more grief died. To feel thou robst a worthier man, to wrong a soldier's right, your harp's sweet touch, curled locks, fine shapes, and gifts so ex ex exquisite, given thee by Venus. Would have done your fine dames little good when blood and dust had ruffled them and had as little stood thyself instead but what thy care of all these in these fly we should inflict on thee ourselves infectious cowardice in thee hath terrified our host for which thou wilt deserved a coat of tombstone not of steel in which for form thou servest to this thus Paris spake, for form that mighty inhabit heaven. Hector, because thy sharp reproof is out of justice given, I take it well, but through thy heart, inured to these affrights, cuts through them as an axe through oak. That more rust, more excites. The workman's faculty, whose art can make the edge so far. Yet I, less practised than thyself in these extremes of war, may well be pardoned, though less blood and bold. And these your worth exceeds in others' mind. Or is my mind of less force to the deeds required in war because my form and flows and gifts of peace and approach not, therefore, the kind of gifts of golden Cyprides? All heaven's gifts have their worthy price, as little to be scorned, as to be won with strength, wealth, state, with which to be adorned. Some men would change state, wealth, or strength, but if your martial heart, which me, to make it my challenge good, and hold it such a part of shame to give it over thus, cause all the rest to rest, and twixt both hosts let Spartan king and me perform our best. For Helen with the wealth she brought, and he that overcomes our proves superior in any way in all our equal dooms. Let him enjoy her utmost wealth, keep her or take her home. The rest strike leagues of endless date and hearty friends become. You dwelling safely in Glebe, Troy. The Greeks retire their force. Tachia, that breeds fairest dames and Argos fairest horse. He said, and his immenseful words did Hector highly please, who rushed betwixt those fighting hosts and made the Trojans cease. By holding up in midst his lance, the Grecians noted not. The signal he for parley used, but at him fiercely shot, hurled stones, and still were levelling darts. At last the king of men, great Agamemnon, cried aloud, Argives for shame contain, youths of Achaea shoot no more, the fair-helmed Hector shows. As he desired to treat with us, this said, all ceased from blows. And Hector spake to both the hosts, Trojan and hardy Greeks, Here now, what do you think stirred these wars? For their cessation seeks. He bids us all, and you disarm, that he alone may fight with Menelaus for us all, for Helen and her right. With all the dower she brought to Troy, and he that wins the day, or is in all the art of arms, superior in any way, the queen and all her sorts of wealth, let him at will enjoy. The rest strike truce, and let love seal from leagues twixt Greece and Troy. The Greek host wandered at this brave silence, flew everywhere. At last spake Sparta's warlike king. Now also give me ear, whom grief gives most cause of reply. I now have hope to free the Greeks and Trojans of all ills they have sustained for me. And Alexander, that was cause I stretched my spleen so far of both then, which is nearest fate, let his death end the war. The rest immediately retire and greet all homes in peace. Go then, bless your champion, and give his power success. Fetch for the earth and for the sun and the gods whom ye call two lambs, a black one and a white one, a female and a male. And we and other are for ourselves will fetch and kill to Jove to sign which rites bring Priam's force because we well approve. His sons, perfidious, envious, and out of practice bane, to faith when she believes in them, Jove's high truce may profane. All young men's hearts are still unstead. But in those well-weighed deeds, an old man will consent to pass things past, and what succeeds, he looks into, that he may know how best to make his way, through both the fortunes of a fact, and that will worst obey. This granted a delightful hope, both Greeks and jo Trojans fed, of longed for rest from these long toils that tedious war had bred. Their horses then in rank, they set, drawn from the chariots round, Descend themselves, took off their arms, and placed them on the ground near one another. 
for the space between the hosts was small. Hector, two heralds sent to Troy, that they from thence might call King Priam to bring the lambs to rate the truce they swore, but Agamemnon to the fleet Taltibius sent before to fetch their lamb, whom nothing slack the royal charge was given. Iris, the rainbow, then came down, ambassadress from heaven, to white-armed Helen. She assumed at every part the grace of Helen's last love, sister's shape, who had the highest place in Helen's love, and had to name Ladice, most fair of all the daughters Priam had, and made the nuptial pair with Helicone, royal sprout of old, and eternal seed. She found Queen Helen at home, at work about a weed, woven for herself. It shined like fire, was rich and full of size, the work of both sides being alike, in which she did comprise. The many labours wore like Troy and brass on Greece endured, for her sake, by cruel Mars and his turned friends procured. Iris came in, in joyful haste, and said, Oh, come with me. Loved nymph, and an admired sight of Greeks and Trojans, see, who first on one another brought a war so full of tears, even thirsty and contentious war. Now every man forbears, and friendly by each other sits, each leaning on his shield. Their long and shining lances pitched, fast by them in the field. Paris and Sparta's king alone must take up all strife. And he that conquers only call fair Helena a wife. Thus spake the thousand-coloured dame, and to her mind commends the joy to see her friends espouse her native towns and friends, which stirred a sweet desire in her to serve with which she hide, shadowed her graces with white veils, and though she took a pride to set her thoughts at gaze and see in her clear beauty's flood, what choice and glory swum to her yet tender womanhood, seasoned with tears her joys, to see more joys the more offence and that perfection could not flow from earthly excellence. Thus went she forth, and took with her her woman most of name, Ethra, Pythias' lovely birth, and Clymene, whom fame hath for her fair eyes memorized. They reached the Scian towers, where Priam sat to see the fight with all his counsellors, Panthus, Lampus, Clytius, and stout Hecateon. Thermetus, wise Antenor, and profound Ucalagion, all grave old men and soldiers they had been but for age, now left the wars, yet counsellors they were exceeding sage, and as in well-groomed woods or trees, cold spiny grass hoppers, sit chirping and send voices out that scarce can pierce our ears, for softness and their weak faint sound, so talking on the tower, the senior of the people sat, who when they saw the power of beauty in the queen ascend even those cold-spirited peers, those wise and almost withered men, found this heat in their ears, that they were forced, through whispering, to say, what man can blame, the Greeks and Trojans to endure for so admired a dame. So many miseries and so long, and her sweet countenance shine, looks like the goddesses, and yet though never so divine, before we boast unjustly still of her enforced prize, and justly suffer for her sake with all our progenies, labour and ruin let her go, the prophet of her land must pass the beauty. Thus, though these cold could bear so fit a hand on their affections, yet when all their gravest powers were used, they could not choose but welcome her, and rather they accused the gods than beauty. For thus spake the most famed king of Troy. Come, loved daughter, sit by me and take the worthy joy of thy first husband's sight, old friends and princes near allied. And name me some of these brave Greeks, so many, beautified. Come, do not think I lay the wars endured by us on thee. The gods have sent them, and the tears in which they swam to me. Sit then, and name this goodly Greek so tall and broadly spread, who than the rest that stand by him is higher by the head, the bravest man I ever saw, and most majestical. His only presence makes me think I'm king amongst them all. The fairest of her sex replied, most reverend father-in-law, most loved, most feared, what some ill death had seized me when I saw the first mean why I wronged you thus, that I had never lost the sight of these my ancient friends, whom that loved me most. Of my sole daughter, brothers both, with all those kindly mates, of one soil, one age, born with me, though under different fates. But these boons envious stars deny the memory of these. In sorrow pines those beauties now, then that did too much please. Nor satisfy 
They your demand, to which I thus reply, that's Agamemnon, Atreus' son, in great, in emperor. A king whom double royalty doth crown, being great and good, and one that was my brother-in-law, when I contained my blood. And what's more worthy, if at all I might be said to be, my being, being lost so soon in all that honoured me, the good old king admired and said, O oh, Atreus, blessed son, born unto joyful destinies, that hast the empire won of such a world of Grecian youths as I discover here. I once marched into Phrygia, that many vines doth bear, where many Phrygians I beheld well skilled in use of horse, that two, those two of men, uh, my two gods, or the commanded force, Atreus and great Migdenus, who on the Sangarius sands sat down their tents, with whom myself and my assistant bands was numbered as a man and chief, the cause of war was then the Amazon dames, that in their facts affected to be men, and all there was a mighty power which yet did never rise, to equal these Achaean youths that have the sable eyes. Then, seeing Ulysses next, he said, Love, daughter, what is he that lower than the great Atreus' son seemed by the head to me, yet in his shoulders and big breast presents a broader show, his armor lies upon the earth he up and down doth go to see his soldiers keep their ranks and ready to have their arms if in this truce they should be tried by any false alarms much like a well-grown bellwether or feltered ram he shows that walks before a wealthy flock of fair white fleece and ewes high jove and leader's fairest sea to priam thus replies this is the old laertes son ulysses called the wise who, though unfruitful Ithaca hath made his nursing seat, yet knows he every sort of slight, and is in counsel great. The wise Antinor answered her, "'Tis true, renowned dame. Sometimes past, wise Ithacus to Troy a legate came, with man allows for your cause, to whom I gave receipt as guests, and welcome to my house with all the love I might. I learned the wisdom of their soil and humours of their blood, for when the Trojan council met, and these together stood, by heights of his broad shoulders, had a treatise eminence. Yet set, Ulysses did exceed, and bred more reverence. And when their counsels and their words they wove in one, the speech of Atreus' son was passing loud, small fast, yet did not reach to much, being naturally born laconical, nor would. His humour lie for anything, or was like the other old. But when the prudent Ithacus did to his counsels rise, he stood a little still, and fixed upon the earth his eyes, his sceptre moving neither way, but held it formally, like one that vainly doth affect of wrathful quality, and frantic rashly judging him, you would have said he was, but when out of his ample breast he gave a great voice pass, and words that flew about our ears like drifts of winter snow, none thenceforth might contend with him, though naught admired for show. A third man, aged Priam marked was Ajax Telemon, of whom he asked, What lord is that, so large a limb and bone, so raised in height, that to his breast I see there reach it none? To him the goddess of her sex, the large veiled Helen, said, That lord is Ajax Telemon, a bulwark in their aid. And the other side stands Edomen, on Crete, of most command, and round about his royal sides his Cretan captains stand. Oft hath the warlike Spartan king given hospitable due to him within our Lassian court and all his retinue. And now the other archive dukes I generally discern, all which I know, and all their names could make thee quickly learn. Two princes of the people yet I know where can behold, Castor the skilful knight on horse and Pollux uncontrolled. For all stand fights and force of hand, both out of birth and bred. My natural brothers... Either here they have not followed from lovely Sparta, or arrived within the seaborne fleet, in fear of infamy for me in broad fields shame to meet. Nor so, for holy Tellus's womb enclosed those worthy men in Sparta, their beloved soil. The voiceful heralds then, the firm agreement of the gods, though all the city ring, two lambs and spirit for refreshing wine and fruit for they bring. Within a goatskin bottle closed, they us also brought a massy glittering bowl and cups that all of gold were brought. Bearing to the king, they cried, Son of Laomedon. Rise for the well-rowed peers of Troy and brass on Greeks in one. 
Stand to thee, descend the field that they firm vows may make. For Paris and the Spartan king must fight for Helen's sake with long armed lances. And the man that proves victorious, the woman and the well she brought, shall follow to his house. The rest knit friendship and firm leagues, we safe in Troy shall dwell, in Argos and Achaia, they that do in dames excel. He said, and Priam's aged joints with chilled fear did shake, yet instantly he bade his men his chariot ready make, which soon they did, and he ascends. He takes the reins and guides, Antinor calls, whom instantly mounts to his royal side, and through the ski on ports to feel the swift foot horse they drive. And when they, them, of Troy and Greece, of aged lords, arrive, from horse and Troy's well-feeding soil, to both the hosts they go. When straight up rose the king of men, up rose Ulysses too. The heralds in their rigid coats repeat as wise the guise, the true vows of the Greeks and gods. Term theirs, since made there before their eyes. Then in a cup of gold they mix the wine that each side brings, and next pour water on the hands of both the king of kings. Which down a treatise drew his knife that evermore he put, with when the large sheet of his sword with which away he cut the wool from both fronts of the lambs, which has a right in use of execration to their heads that break the plighted truce. The heralds of both hosts did give the peers of both, and then with hands and voice advanced to heaven, thus prayed the king of men. O Jove, that Eda dost protect, and hast the titles won, most glorious, most invincible, and thou all seeing sun. All hearing, all recomforting floods, earth, and powers beneath, that all the perjuries of men chastising not of death, by witnesses and see perform the hearty vows we make, if Alexander shall the life of men allow us take. He shall from henceforth Helena with all her wealth retain, and we will to our household gods hoist sail and home again. If by my honoured brother's hand be Alexander slain, the Trojans then shall his forced queen with all their wealth restore, and pay convenient fine to us eight hours for evermore. Priam and his sons deny the pay thus agreed, when Alexander shall be slain, or that perfidious deed, and for the fine will I fight here, that dearly they repay, by death and ruin that amends the falsehood keeps away. This said the throats of both lambs cut with his royal knife. He laid them panting on the earth till quite deprived of life. The steel had robbed them of their strength, then golden cups they crowned with wine out of a cistern drawn which poured upon the ground. They fell upon their humble knees to all the deities, and thus prayed one of both the hosts that might do sacrifice of Jupiter, most high, most great, and all the deathless powers, who first shall dare to violate the late sworn oath of ours. So let the bloods and brains of them, and all they shall produce, Flow on the stained face of the earth as now the sacred juice, and let their wives with bastard eyes brand all their future race. Thus prayed they, but with wished effects. Their prayers, La Jove, did not grace. When Priam said, Lords of both hosts, I can no longer stay to see my loved son try his life, and so much take my way to wind exposed Ilion. Jove, yet in heaven's high states, know only which of these must now pay tribute to the fates. Thus, putting in his coach the lambs, he mounts and reins his horse, Antenor to him and to Troy both their speedy course. Then Hector, Priam's martial son, stepped forth and met the ground, with wise Ulysses, where he bows of combat most resound, which done into a helm they put two lots and let them know which of the combatants should first his brass piled javelin throw. When all the people standing by with hands held up to heaven prayed Jove the conquest might not be by force or fortune given, but that the man who was in right the author of most wrong might feel his justice and no more of these tedious wars prolong. But sinking to the house of death, leave them as long before, linked fast in leagues of amity that might dissolve no more. Then Hector shook the helm that held the equal dooms of chance looked back and drew on Priam's first had lot to hurl his lance. The soldiers all sat down and ranked, each by his arms and horse. But then they lay down and cooled their hooves and noth allotted course, bids fair-haired Helen, husband's arms, who first makes fast his greaves, with silver buckles to his legs, then on his breast receives the curates that Lycaon wore his brother, but made fit 
for his fair body next to his sword he took and fastened it. All damasked underneath his arm, his shield and grave and great, his shoulders wore, and on his head his glorious helm he set, topped with a plume of horse's hair that horribly did chance and seemed to threaten as he moved at last he takes his lance, exceedingly big and full of weight, which he with ease could use in like sorts by his warlike king, himself his arms and Jews. Thus armed at either army boat they both, so bravely in, possessing both hosts with amaze, they came so chin to chin, and in such horrible aspects, each other did salute. A fair large field was made for them, their wraths for hugeness mute. And mutual made them mutually at either shake their darts before they threw. Then Paris first with his long javelin parts, it smote the treatises or be targe, but ran not through the brass. For in it arming well the shield a head reflected was. Then did the second combatant apply him to his spear, which ere he threw, he thus besought almighty Jupiter. O oh, Jove, vouchsafe me now of revenge, and that my enemy, for doing wrong so undeserved, may pay deserved lie. Eh, the pains he forfeited, and let these hands inflict those pains, by conquering I, by conquering dead, on him whom life complains, that any now or any one of all the brood of men to live hereafter may with fear from all offence abstain, much more from all those such foul offence to him that was his host, and entertained him as the man whom he affected most. This said, he shook and threw his lance, which struck through Paris's shield, and with the strength he gave to it, it made the curates yield. His coat of mail, his breast, and all, and drove his entrails in, and that low region where the girts in three small parts begin, yet he in bowing to his breast prevented sable death. This taint he followed with his sword drawn from a silver sheath, which lifting high he struck his helm, full where his plume did stand, on which it piecemeal break and fell from his unhappy hand. At which he sighing stood and starred upon the ample sky and said, O oh Jove, there is no god given more illiberal I to those that serve thee than my eyes self. Why have I prayed in vain? I hoped my hand should have revenged the wrongs I still sustain on him that did them and still dares their foul defence pursue. And now my lance hath missed his end, my sword and shivers flew, and he escapes all. With this again he rushed upon his guest and caught him by the horsehair plume that dangled on his crest. With thought to drag him to the Greeks, which he had surely done, and so besides the victory had wondrous glory won, because the needle painted lance with which his helm was tied beneath his chin and so about his dainty throat implied had strangled him, but that in time the Cyprian seed of Jove did break the string with which was lined that which the needle wove and was the tough thong of a steer and so the victor's palm was for the full of man-at-arms only an empty helm but then he swung about his head, cast among his friends, who scrambled and took up his shouts again that he intends to force the lifeblood of his foe and ran on him amain with shaken javelin when the queen the lovers loves again attended and now ravished him from that encounter quite with ease and wondrous suddenly for she a goddess might. She hid him in a cloud of gold and never made him known till in his chamber fresh and sweet she gently set him down and went for Helen, whom she found in skiers utmost height, to which whole swarms of city dames had climbed to see the sight. To give her errant good success, she took on her the shape of Bedelm Greer, who was brought by Helen in her rape from Lacedaemon, and had trust in all her secrets still, being old and hath of all her maids the main bent of her will, and spun for her her finest wool. Like her love's empress came, pulled Helen by the heavenly veil, and softly said, Madame, my lord calls for you. You must needs make all your kind haste home. He's in your chamber, stays and longs, sits by your bed, pray come. Tis richly made and sweet, but he more sweet than looks so clear. So fresh and movingly attired that seeing you would swear, he came not from the dusky fight, but from a courtly dance, or word to dancing. This she made a charm for dalliance. Is virtue Helen felt, 
A new by her so radiant eyes, white neck, and most enticing breasts, the deified disguise, at which amazed she answered her unhappy deity. Why lovest thou still in these deceits to wrap my fantasy, or whether yet of all the towns given to their lost besides in Phrygia Myona, comest thou to be my guide? If there of divers language men thou hast, as here in Troy, some other friend to be my shame, since here thy latest joy by men allowest now subdued, by him shall I be born. Home to his court, and end my life in triumphs of his scorn. And to this end would thy deceits my wanton life allure. Hence go thyself to Priam's son, and all the ways abjure of gods of godlike minded dames, and never turn again. Thy earth affected feet to heaven but for his sake sustain. Toils here, guard, grace him endlessly, till he requite thy grace, and give thee my place with him. Or take a servant's place. If all dishonourable ways your favour seek to serve, his never pleasing continence I better will deserve than serve his dotage now. What shame were it for me to feed this lust in him? Of all honoured dames would hate me for the deed. He leaves a woman's love so shamed and shows so base a mind to feel not my shame nor his own the griefs of greater kind. Wound me that such as can admit such kind delight so soon. The goddess, angry that past shame, her mere will was not done, replied, Incense me not, you wretch. This once incensed I leave, thy cursed life has too strange hate. As yet it may receive a love from me, and lest I spread through both hosts such despite, for those plagues they have felt for thee, and both abjure thee quite, and setting thee in midst of both, turn all their wraths on thee, and dart thee dead, that such a death may wreak thy wrong of me. This struck the fair dame with such a fear. He took her speech away, and shattered in her snowy veil she durst but not obey. And yet, to shun the shame she feared, she vanished undescried. Of all the Trojan ladies there, for Venus was her guide. Arrived at home, her women both fell to the work in haste, when she that was of all her sex the most divinely graced ascended to a higher room, though much against her will, where lovely Alexander was, being led by Venus still. The laughter, loving dame, descend her move, mind by her grace, and for her mirth's sake set a stool full before Paris's face, where she would needs have Helen sit, who though she durst not choose, but sit yet lucked away for all the goddess power could use, and used her tongue too, and to chide whom Venus has soothed so much, and cheered too in this better. And was thy cowardice such, so conquered to be seen alive, or would to God thy life, had perished by his worthy hand, to whom I first was wife? Before this thou wouldst glorify thy valour and thy lance, and pass my first love's boast them far, go once more and advance. Thy braves against the single power, this foil might fall by chance. Poor conquered man. T'was such a chance, as I would not advise. Thy valour should provoke again, shun him, thou most unwise. Lest next thy spirit sent to hell, thy body be his prize. He answered, pray thee, woman, cease to chide and grieve me thus. Disgraces will not ever last. Look on their end, on us. We love the gods at other times, let fall the victors wreathe. As on him Paris put it now, shall our loves sink beneath. The hate of fortune in love's fire, let all hates vanish, come. Love never so inflame my heart, no, not when bringing home thy beauty so delicious prize on Crenet's blessed shore. I longed for and enjoyed thee first, with this he went before, she after to the odorous bed, while these to pleasure yield. Perplexed at treatise, savage-like, ran up and down the field, and every thicket troop of Troy, and of their far-called aid, searched for his foe who could not be by any eye betrayed. Nor out of friendship out of both did they conceal his sight, all hated him so like their deaths, and owed him such despite. At last I spake the king of men. Hear me, ye men of Troy, ye Darans, and the rest whose power you in their aids employ. The conquest on my brother's part ye all discern is clear. Do you then, Argive Helena, with all her treasures here, restore to us, and pay the mulct that by your vows is due. Yield us an honoured recompense, and all 
that shall accrue to our posterities confirm that when you render it, our acts may here be memorized. This all else Greeks thought fit.